Germany is complicit in Israel's genocide in Gaza, and that must end. That's Nicaragua's argument before the UN's top court. Germany says Nicaragua has a one-sided view of the war in Gaza. What does this case mean for countries supplying Israel with weapons? This is Inside Story. Hello there, I'm James Bayes. Nicaragua has asked the International Court of Justice to order Germany to stop supplying Israel with weapons immediately. It argues Berlin is complicit in genocide taking place in Gaza. The case joins two others involving Israel already before the ICJ. Nicaragua's case is more broad, drawing on both the Genocide and Geneva Conventions, and is notable for being the first to involve two countries not directly involved in the alleged atrocities. Governments around the world will undoubtedly take notice. Germany is the second largest weapons supplier to Israel after the United States. So what does this case mean for other countries that contribute to Israel's extensive military network? Could third parties be held accountable for enabling a genocide? We'll discuss all of this with our panel of guests in just a moment. But first, this report from Alexandra Byers. Eighty years after the Holocaust, Germany is being accused of facilitating genocide. Nicaragua is calling on the International Court of Justice to stop all German arms exports to Israel. It argues the Israeli army is using those weapons and ammunition against Palestinians in Gaza, and by extension, Berlin is enabling acts of genocide. The norms of the Genocide Convention, which are part of customary international law, impose the obligation on third states to undertake to prevent genocide. This obligation arises from the moment that that state becomes aware that genocide might be committed. And there can be no question that Germany, as is evident from the preceding comments, was well aware and is well aware of at least the serious risk of genocide being committed. Germany is the second largest arms supplier to Israel after the U.S., and its exports include torpedoes, submarine parts, anti-tank weapons, and military protective gear. Berlin recognizes the ICJ's jurisdiction. The U.S. does not. Lawyers for Germany have dismissed Nicaragua's accusations as biased and say Berlin is doing all it can to fulfill its obligations to both Palestinians and Israelis. Germany only supplies arms on the basis of detailed scrutiny, a scrutiny that not only respects but far exceeds the requirements of international law. Arms exports that take into account the security threats Israel is facing, in particular, immediately after 7 October. At the same time, Germany's supply of arms and other military equipment to Israel is subject to a continuous evaluation of the situation on the ground. The landmark case joins two others currently before the UN's top court. South Africa accused Israel of committing genocide in Gaza, which the court found was plausible. And the ICJ has accepted a motion by the UN General Assembly on the legality of Israel's occupation of the Palestinian territories. Now, Nicaragua's case could have consequences for governments around the world. Can countries that are not committing atrocities directly still be held responsible for them? Alexandra Byers, Al Jazeera for Inside Story. Let's dig deeper into the significance of this case and what, if any, difference it'll make with our guests today from Wiesbaden in Germany. We're joined by Matthias Goldman, a senior research fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law. In Haifa, Diana Buto, a Palestinian lawyer and advocate of the Palestinian cause. And in New York, Kenneth Roth is a visiting professor at the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. He was the executive director of Human Rights Watch. Thank you for joining uh, me, all of you. We have an eminent panel of lawyers today. I am not a lawyer, Ken, though, so let's start in layman's language. In your view, how strong is this case? Well, it's based on you know, a very simple premise, which is that you should not be arming 
a government that is committing war crimes, let alone plausible genocide, as the International Court of Justice has called it. Now, there's actually a precedent for this. You may remember back to the former Liberian president, Charles Taylor. He was convicted of aiding and abetting war crimes and other atrocities in neighboring Sierra Leone because he armed an abusive rebel group there. And he's currently serving a 50-year prison term in a British prison. So there is precedent for this. Now, the International Court of Justice is a civil court. It's not a criminal court. But this premise that you shouldn't be arming a country and military that's committing atrocities is you know, morally simple and legally straightforward. Mateus, let me ask you um, about the comments from the Nicaraguan ambassador who opened the case for Nicaragua. Now, to be clear, you don't represent the German government here. You are German and a German lawyer. Um, he said there's no question that Germany was well aware and is well aware of at least the serious risk of genocide being committed. What do you make of that basic case? Well, James, I think it's a very good proposition to start the case. And I think that Nicaragua has uh, made a very strong presentation in the sense that they gave a, a, they displayed the problems that many people around the world have with uh, weapons deliveries in, uh, in to Israel in in the current conflict uh, so I, I would say that in some to some extent they really exposed the double standards of uh, the Western world and uh, uh, that is, from a moral point of view, a very strong case which they made. Whether that is going to be a successful case before the International Court of Justice is a little bit different because the International Court of Justice is bound by rules of procedure and, uh, you know, the, the, the substantive international legal provisions applicable in the case. And in that regard, the complication is that it's quite an indirect way in which Nicaragua is challenging Germany's acts. So it's um, actually criticizing or it's suing Germany for acts to which Germany contributes, which, however, have been committed by Israel. And this indirect way of tackling the conflict, of bringing the conflict to the court, may ultimately have an impact on the success of Nicaragua's case, even though many people would agree that there have been violations of international humanitarian law, and even though the question whether a genocide is unfolding is, uh, is still uh, pending in a different case before the court. Diana, you are a lawyer too and former legal advisor to the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO. But actually, I'd like to start with you taking off your legal hat and tell me, what do Palestinians make of this case? Are they following it? What do they make of it? They're not following it as closely as they were following, obviously, the South African case, but they are indeed following it, and there's a reason for that. Uh, it's because Palestinians have tried everything. We've tried diplomatic means. We've tried to push for statehood. We've tried practically everything, and the world time and again has failed Palestinians. And so now Palestinians are looking and saying, isn't it time that these systems that particularly the Europeans, have been wagging their fingers at us for, for decades, saying that we should be using legal systems. It's time to test those legal systems and see whether the law actually does apply to Israel or whether Israel is above the law. So people are indeed following it. And this really is a test of this, along with the other cases, of course, is a test of the legal system and the robustness of the legal system. Is it a system in which it applies to some countries, or is it a system in which it applies to all? And if it applies to all, then we must start seeing that Israel is held accountable through sanctions, through arms embargoes, and through other mechanisms as well. Ken, let me ask you a question that, when I was doing the research for this programme, puzzled me a bit, which is, why is Nicaragua not suing the United States? And I did a lot of reading about this. It seems to go back to the Reagan administration and the case, again, involving Nicaragua versus the US. And after that, um, the US decided not to recognise some of the ICJ's jurisdiction. Can you explain it a bit more, a bit better to me, for me, please? James, it's a, it's a bit that, it's a bit the way that the United States ratified the Genocide Convention. But to put it very simply, um, the U.S. has not submitted to the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice on a 
blanket basis, but only case by case, meaning it would have to consent to be sued by Nicaragua, whereas Germany has consented in a blanket basis. Nicaragua could sue in this case, and Germany was stuck with it. So that's why Germany, the second largest arms provider, was sued rather than the United States. Now, and it's worth at some point in this show mentioning that you know, Nicaragua is a poor plaintiff here. You know, it's a brutal dictatorship. It's one of the most repressive countries in Latin America. Um, that's irrelevant to the merits of the case, but it's unfortunate that Nicaragua was the plaintiff here. Now, let's say a word, if we could, about the German defense here, because German lawyers kind of put forth three arguments. None of them are, are very good. Um, one of them was like, oh, we support Palestinian rights, but, you know, who cares? if you're also arming Israel as it bombs and starves Palestinian civilians. Um, you know, second, it said Israel's not committing war crimes, you know, which is just laughable. I mean, anybody can see that it is. And the third that really goes to the heart of the German state today, it said it's a stat raison. It's a reason for the state as a result of the Nazi responsibility for the Holocaust to support Israel. And that, in my view, is the wrong lesson of the Holocaust. The lesson of Holocaust should be that you oppose atrocities, you oppose war crimes, whoever commits them, even if they're by the Israeli government, rather than that you support the Israeli government, even if it's committing war crimes and plausible genocide. It's the wrong lesson. Matthias, your take on that, you're the German on the panel. Give us your view of the historical context. And as Ken say, says there, he believes that Germany's learnt the, long, the wrong lesson. Definitely, this is a valid argument to be made. There is uh, uh, quite a, a vivid debate, I would say, at the moment, whether uh, this um, position, this policy position of the German government, that the security of Israel is part of Germany's reason of state, is still valid and, sh and should still be maintained, in particular if it is understood as a kind of blanket support for whatever Israel does. I think you could see over the last couple of weeks that the German government has tried to uh, at least publicly articulate its concern for the humanitarian situation in Gaza several times. And of course, ultimately, that will, uh, will, will pose the question to what extent Germany will unconditionally support Israel. And at some point, that will also raise the question to what extent one can cooperate with Israel in a military respect. Diana, this, like the South Africa case, is likely to go on for a very long time. But I think Nicaragua, probably like South Africa, cares about the immediate measures the court puts in place, what are called the provisional measures. Now, they're calling for Germany to immediately suspend its aid to Israel, particularly the military, uh, the military arms shipments. But also important, it says it must resume its support and financing of UNRWA, UNRWA being the UN agency uh, that is the main uh, humanitarian agency operating in Gaza. How important is that? The only way that aid at this point in time can be effectively delivered in the Gaza Strip is through those bodies that have had a history of delivering that aid, and that is UNRWA. And the fact that we saw that immediately uh, the day after the, the order for provisional measures came out, that Israel made these false allegations against UNRWA, allegations that have not been proven and for which there's been no investigation, and immediately we saw that countries cut off aid, it was a means by which Israel was able to overshadow the provisional measures decision and turn, turn people's uh, attention to a different issue. Now, I think it's important to bear in mind, Israel has not complied with the provisional measures order that came out in January, and it continues to be in violation of not only that, but of the other um, demands as well for a ceasefire and you name it. So this request that Israel, that, uh, that uh, the Germany not only stop giving weapons to Israel, but also resume aid, is a means through a backhanded way of actually giving support to Palestinians at a time when Israel has made it clear that they intend to carry out genocide, and they are, in fact, carrying out genocide. It's worth stating that Germany, in its 
um, uh, submission in the court said it was the biggest supplier to humanitarian aid to the OPT, that's the technical term, Occupied Palestinian Territory. And, Israel, and Germany has been continuing to supply aid even now, including airdrops. And on that point, perhaps it's worth listening to what one of the Nicaraguan lawyers, Daniel Muller, said. It is indeed a pathetic excuse to the Palestinian children, women and men in Gaza to provide humanitarian aid, including through airdrops, on the one hand, and to furnish the weapons and military equipment that are used to kill and annihilate them, and to kill also humanitarian aid workers, as most recently evidenced by the missile attack against vehicles and workers of World Central Kitchen, on the other hand. What do you think of that, Ken? Well, he's completely right, and I would add to that, which is that the airdrops are really a drop in the bucket. Everybody recognizes that the only way to alleviate the large-scale starvation in Gaza is through delivery by truck. But the same Israeli army that Germany is arming is obstructing that aid delivery. It's letting in drips and drabs of food, but it's imposing these inspection regimes, which force trucks to wait, you know, up to three weeks. Many of them don't get through at all. Um, it has been making it extremely difficult to distribute aid within Gaza. Diana rightly says that UNRWA is, with its 30,000 employees, is the only agency capable of really doing mass distribution in Gaza. Um, Israel has tried to shut that down because, you know, a mere 12 people, allegedly without proof, participated in the October 7th attack. They were all either dismissed or two of them had, were said to have died. So UNRWA did everything it could with those 12 people. But Israel saw an opportunity here. It has had a vendetta against UNRWA for decades because it sees UNRWA as the way that Palestinian refugees continue to hope to return to Israel. Now, that's not UNRWA's doing. You know, Palestinian refugees know that they're Palestinian refugees, whether UNRWA is there or not. They long to return to their ancestral home, whether or not there's UNRWA. But Israel, despite knowing that it's aggravating starvation, has been on this vendetta against UNRWA. And while Germany has now resumed funding of UNRWA elsewhere in the region, it continues not to fund UNRWA in Gaza, where UNRWA is the key to alleviating potential famine. Diana, I know you, like all of our panel, have been watching the developments in The Hague. Uh, on Monday, Nicaragua's case. On Tuesday, Germany's response. Tell me, in terms of the whole case, how much is this new legal ground and could there be a legal precedent here? It's hard for me to say because I have a fear. I fear that what the court is going to do instead is wait for the larger case in relation to South that South Africa brought forward uh, to wait to deal with that first. That's that's my fear, and so it's hard to say. It is important to bear in mind, though, and um, both of my co-panelists have said this very eloquently. There is a responsibility not just on Israel to not uh, carry out genocide, but there's also a responsibility on third states as well, to prevent genocide from happening as well. And this case speaks about the idea of prevention of genocide. We already know what Israel's doing. It's made its intentions very clear. We see the actions on the ground. We see the forced starvation. We see everything that it's doing. And now it's really imperative for the world to act. Whether the court takes that, that same route and says, yes, indeed, we're going to be issuing some measures is an entirely different matter. But it is important for the world to understand that, it, that it, this isn't just upon Israel to stop genocide. It also requires that other countries around the world, every country around the world, act and make sure that Palestinians are not, um, are not subjected to this genocide. The problem with that, Mateus, is, is we've already seen the court act with its provisional measures twice uh, with regard to the South Africa um, case. They, uh, they reacted and then they came back again and said, you're still not doing it. Um, the court's rulings are legally binding, are they not? But the problem is it doesn't have any sort of enforcement mechanism. Well, you know, James, um, to be legally binding doesn't mean necessarily that uh, you have to be able to send troops or a, a police force to enforce them. Otherwise, it would be for naught. And to be legally binding can have consequences uh, for countries. For example, uh, they might um, have to pay reparations if they violate international legal rules at some point. And uh, 
that could be enforced by governments that or by you know ultimately by um, Palestine which in this case is uh, the party to to whom these obligations like the obligation to respect humanitarian law the obligation not to commit genocide are owned and uh, there are ways of enforcing these uh, reparations even though that can be a lengthy process but that doesn't mean at all that it's uh, it's totally irrelevant moreover i would say that in the case in which germany is being sued um, as one of the you know one of the largest economic powers but also a um, political power at least uh, in europe if germany gets a um, an order to respect certain conditions and uh, if it is seen to be in violation of that order it's a reputational damage of sorts so should that happen germany would have all reasons to respect it because otherwise you cannot go around and base your foreign policy on the premise that you're respecting international law which is one of the you know the basic tensions that germany is uh, uh, having here on the one hand it's historical responsibility on the other hand it's commitment to international law and to build a credible foreign policy which might be important for many different things it needs to respect international law or at least needs to be able to make a plausible case to respect international law and you can't do that any longer if the international court of justice is telling you that you're in violation okay let's have a quick look at where israel is getting its weapons from germany is the second largest provider of arms to israel accounting for 30 percent of all its weapons imports the u.s is by far its largest supplier it gives Israel annual military aid worth $3.8 billion. Last year, Germany increased deliveries nearly tenfold to $354 million. Most were improved, approved in the immediate aftermath of Hamas's October the 7th attack on southern Israel. Since 2015, the UK's contributions amount to more than half a billion dollars and include components for F-35 fighter jets. Also since 2015, Canada has sent military equipment worth $84 million to Israel before it suspended exports in February. Ken, Canada, yes, Belgium, Italy, the Netherlands and Spain, they're all countries that have suspended or restricted arms sales to Israel. Are we slowly seeing Israel's um, pipeline of weapons drying up? I mean, James, yes and no. Um, other governments are slowly ending this supply of arms, but by far and away the most important supplier, as you noted, is the United States. And Joe Biden has been reluctant to take that step. This also comes back to your prior question. You know, an international court of justice ruling is binding. Israel is, you know, legally required to comply with the precautionary measures to avoid plausible genocide. It hasn't done that. Um, one way to force compliance would be through the UN Security Council, but that requires contending with the UN, US veto. The other would be simply for powerful governments like the United States to say, we are gonna stop the military aid, we are gonna stop the arms sales, until okay, we okay, Ken. Well, let me Not ask you about the. U let me ask you specifically yes. about the U.S. Ken right now, because we had at the end of last week, 37 members of Congress, including the former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, write a letter saying that if um, that, that uh, in light of the recent uh, strike against aid workers, we believe it's unjustifiable to pr to approve weapons transfers. There is something called the Leahy Laws. Um, the, the former Senator Patrick Leahy, who put those laws in place, who they're named after, says the U.S. is now breaking the law. Is, are things, in your view, changing now in the U.S. or not? Yes, James, in the sense that there is mounting pressure on Biden to do the right thing, to condition further military aid or arms sales on an end to Israel's bombing and starving of Palestinian civilians in Gaza. So there's tons of pressure there. He certainly, you know, would be within the law to do that, he's just resisting. And it is a bit of a puzzle why that is. Part of it is he seems to sort of think of Israel back in 1967 when it was David surrounded by the Goliath of the combined Arab armies. You know, partly it's just that, um, you know, he's thinking about this coming election in November and is focused, you know, on the movable middle, the handful of independents in the six swing states, and is basically taken for granted the progressive side of the Democratic Party. That's beginning to change with the Michigan primary where a large number of uncommitted voters suggested that, you know, some Democrats might just stay home and not vote at all. You know, Biden says, oh, they won't vote for Trump, but if they don't vote for anybody, 
that's effectively a vote for Trump. So he's taking that for granted. That said, because there is mounting American pressure to stop aiding and abetting these war crimes, this plausible genocide in Gaza, um, Biden is under pressure to do the right thing. And we know that in his conversation just last week with Netanyahu, he sort of began to hint that maybe at some point in the future, U.S. relations would be affected if, Biden, if, if Netanyahu didn't change. But it's still very mushy. There still is not an explicit conditionality imposed on the military aid and the arms sales. Matthias, let me ask you, how are things changing in terms of the public discourse in Germany? I saw there was a group of 600 German civil servants who again wrote a petition saying that Israel is committing crimes in Gaza in contradiction of international law and therefore in contradiction to the Constitution. Do you notice a change in Germany now? I do notice a change in Germany now. I think that immediately after... Uh, October 7, uh, there was a lot of solidarity uh, towards Israel. I think there is still solidarity in particular for, you know, the victims of these attacks, for the hostages. But criticism of Israel is rising. I, I notice, at least in parts of the German public, that we increasingly have a more nuanced understanding of Israel, uh, which means that um, we don't take Netanyahu's position and his government's position, in which um, you know quite uh, problematic uh, ministers are assembled, at least to some extent. Uh, we don't take that to be um, the the be all and end all of Israel. We recognize that there is a plurality of views in Israel. There's uh, there has been lots of demonstrations in uh, Tel Aviv and all around Israel, actually, and uh, much of that is also perceived in Germany. And so people are uh, increasingly uh, seeing that you know there is there is not one clear. It, it, it's very difficult to put yourself on one side of this conflict, given how it is unfolding, and that of course has also an impact on how Germany should, should act, in particular in respect of weapons. At the court today, Germany was trying to make the argument that it is not delivering weapons that could be lethal in a sense, you know, not war weapons in a very narrow sense with which you can shoot. It was only delivering equipment. Second, that um, its deliveries had uh, decreased or its um, its uh, issuance of permits for weapons exports had uh, decreased since October. And that's all valid arguments to make. But what I wonder is, can you really deliver any weapons in the current situation, as opposed to October, uh, where many people ask themselves um, if there is any other way of providing humanitarian aid to Gaza other than through a ceasefire. So uh, that is a responsibility that many people now see very clearly. And they also think about Germany's long-term prospect of maintaining its, um, its status, its standing as a, you know, a, a, a law-respecting country. So okay. I do see, see changes here. OK, thank you very much to all our guests today, Matthias Goldman, Diana Buto and Kenneth Roth. And thanks to you, too, for watching. For more coverage on the cases before the ICJ, plus background and analysis of the war on Gaza, please visit our website, aljazeera.com. If you have comments on all this, you can post them on our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Or find us on X. Look for at AJ Inside Story. From me, James Bays, and the team here in Doha, please stay safe. Bye-bye for now.